Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Merci m'avoir invité d'être avec vous, parmi vous cet après-midi. I'm delighted to be here. It's great fun to see the pictures of all the infrastructure work that's going on and that your members are associated with. And it's awe-inspiring to hear uh, the different fields that women are in now in infrastructure. Uh, you will probably have figured out very quickly uh, since in Leslie's kind in, in introduction, she certainly didn't mention a hydrologist, an agronomist, um, uh, an agriculturalist, uh, any of the ists that usually go into uh, water expertise and, and uh, people that become water experts. Uh, this is indeed true. Uh, my field has been as a public servant, as a diplomat, uh, both, as Leslie said, in Canada and abroad. Uh, and my career in water started when three engineers uh, said they wanted to take me out for a free lunch. And I said, well, I know that you know that I know that you know that I know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And they said, well, enjoy lunch and then we'll talk. So um, after lunch, they said, we want you to become the global chair of the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council. And I said, oh my goodness, that's a name that could only be conjured up by an engineer. Uh, it's not memorable, it's comprehensive, uh, and it certainly wouldn't get anybody coming and knocking on your door and saying, I can't wait to find out what you do. And they said, yes, that's the problem. Uh, we're really good at the nuts and bolts and valves and things that you may not know anything about, but we're not good in policy and we're not good of the kind of policy that leads to better communication. And I said, well, yeah, I think I could probably try and do that. And then I'd get to learn at the same time what it is that you're doing uh, in the utilities. I didn't even know that that was where they all worked was utilities. Uh, it, but that was the beginning of something more than 25 years ago. Uh, that led to a very happy relationship between uh, my policy um, knowledge and the tremendous knowledge that uh, th that the these experts had. Uh, the two of them worked quite well. Policy uh, was what I needed as a public servant to be able, and as a diplomat and as an international diplomat, to be able to say, well, why isn't this working? Why aren't people taking these good recommendations? Uh, what is the factor? Is it is it finance? Is it legal problems? Uh, what is it? Uh, because policy people, like like engineers, go at problems for, from a different angle of vision. So that was how I got into uh, being involved with uh, the with Davos, with uh, a number of uh, organizations which are listed in the CV, but mostly they gave me the great pleasure of working with people who were right working in the water field. So uh, today I thought that I would like to give you an idea of the picture of what's happening with global water. Uh, some of you may wish to extend your career into international field. I'd like you all to at least know a little bit about it. Uh, and uh, this may give you an idea of how your expertise would be very useful in solving some of the global problems in this area. So could I have the next slide, please? <coughs> I'm gonna show you some pictures. And what I'd like you to absorb is the picture, not the numbers. Uh, the picture basically says we're a watery planet, 97.5% of the planet is water, but then it shows you in the drop coming down from that, that only 2.5% of all that water is fresh water. And then if you go down to the next drop, it says, by the way, that fresh water is all encapsulated in glaciers, groundwater, ground and permafrost. And then it says under that, that the available fresh water, the kind we think of and the kind we work with in lakes and rivers, uh, is really a very small percentage even of that percentage. So the first thing to start with, with when you look at water is, well, you know, don't we have an awful lot of water around the world? Well, the answer is yes, but also no, and you'll see why. Move over to the other side of that uh, of that graph, and what that is showing you is that what we, it's answering the question, what do we use this water for? And 70% of it is used for growing the food that we all eat. So we can't go around blaming other people. We all eat the food. 
we do, we have added an enormous number of people to the planet. And so therefore that the, the demand there goes up and up and up. So that's basically just for you to remember. Uh, clearly we have a lot of water in the form of salt water, but that the desalination involved there takes energy and so far create helps to, or at least adds to the uh, air pollution that causes our climate difficulties. Next slide. So here's another picture. And he, again, all I want you to do is remember the contrast between these two pictures, not what's written up there. Uh, this is a pictorial representation going from 1990 to probably about 2030. And it's the red, you can tell without knowing at all that the uncomfortable places to live are red and yellow and orange and the comfortable places up in the upper left hand corner are the blue places represented in blue. And these are the ones that in 1990 had relatively little or infrequent water stress. And you can see that a good part of the world was in that fortunate position. But there were definitely warning signs even at that time uh, in the Middle East and moving over to Asia. Now go down to the bottom, uh, the globe at the bottom down to the right, look at the difference. Uh, there's no more nice, dark blue, comfortable place. Every place in the world is having some instance of water stress, which means the unavailability of water at the time that people would like to be using it or for the purposes that it's been traditionally used. And not only that, that there's an awful lot of yellow in the globe, which says more than occasional water stress, and there's an awful lot of red, not just in Africa and Asia. Look over at, at uh, North America, and you'll see that that water stress extends, and not just in the United States, but also up into Canada. So the world has greatly changed in 30 years, uh, and that stress factor, of course, makes huge demands for more infrastructure to help facilitate and the use of the water that we have. So those are the pictures I wanted you to remember, the great change. Um, why is that happening? Next slide. Basically because we use more water than comes to us through the rain and through the melting of glaciers. Uh, again, you've got the green, but the red there simply says these are places that are overusing uh, the groundwater, the reserves of water they have, and look in North America there. Uh, there is a very real issue in our neighbors to the south, and that's recommend that covers a good part of the Ogallala Aquifer, and it also shows why there's difficulties in other parts of North America. And those will affect us. They, they will certainly uh, uh, call for more infrastructure, but they more than that around the world, they call they have it, it, they call for they they create huge problems. Next slide. What are these problems? Let's look at some of these. Uh, and I think that most of you, because you work in infrastructure, you'll know about the kind of issues that have arisen because of this. Um, first of all, 28% uh, 28%, 28%, sorry, 2 billion people lack continuous daily access to safe, fresh water on an everyday basis. Uh, that means they don't have it all year. Uh, one in five children, therefore, is suffering from uh, the deaths attributable to one in five children have to do with uh, water that is not pure and that is not clean. That still eclipses all of the other childhood diseases. 28% of freshwater fish are under uh, extinction warnings. The one that bothers me, I think, most is that important major rivers no longer get down to the ocean. What does that mean? It means that the Delta, which used to be there, both delivering water to the Deltaic uh, communities and also keeping salt water from climbing back up into the rivers, that stopped. When your Delta is no longer a one-way stream of water coming downstream, and in fact, is allowing a lot of uh, salt water to go upstream, you're changing irrevocably, uh, some, making some very important changes which affect agriculture, which affect lifestyles, and which sometimes empty out the delta entirely. 
Uh, groundwater levels are falling in the whole world. You can tell that from the, the, the overuse of water in a number of countries. Uh, and um, we, we have to cope with increasing variability with heat, drought, floods, et cetera, which all of you know who are involved in infrastructure that what you're designing now is not the same kind of thing you would have been designing 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, that's quantity issues, just a few of them. Quality issues are what make us sick. And these are not a mystery because in Asia, for example, about 80% of wastewater is not treated before it goes back into water. Uh, dilution is not a solution. Uh, and uh, therefore, without the infrastructure that can clean that, uh, th that, that wastewater, these people are in trouble. And 80% of that wastewater does not get cleaned. So we have illness and we have problems of uh, that nature. Canada, we've got climate variety as well. And we've also got real issues with remote communities, um, which are added to uh, by the, the changing amounts of water. Next slide, please. If you're wondering whether you're going to stay, keep on being employed in water infrastructure, uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. If you look at the last two bars in this slide over in the right-hand side, you will see that the, uh, that the, the demand for water is going up and up and up. Uh, world water demand is going to grow by 55%. We don't have that much water, so that is going to mean more digging, more cleaning, uh, more desalination, all of those things simply to try and meet part of that demand. When I was just starting school, the global population was about 3 billion. It's now from 9 going to 10. So therefore, the food, remember, 70% is used for food. Just the food demands alone uh, are creating a huge demand for infrastructure and for getting the water to the food production and to all of the other uses for food, I'm sorry, for water. Next slide. Whose fault is this? Next slide. Well, <clears throat> it's tempting to blame the gentleman on the left. and He's definitely not helping. He's standing up to his ankles. Uh, in other words, he's overusing water in his crop. Uh, and uh, that is a very real uh, issue area, certainly for India with all the other issues that India has. But you look on the right hand side, you can see that uh, we have had our own uh, sins and excesses. Pivot irrigation is those great big wheels that you have seen carrying water uh, to various parts of a field from a single source. And uh, when these were first brought out, a number of these pivot wheels used to throw water in the air at midday, thus causing uh, almost instant evaporation and wasting an awful lot of water. Pivots have changed. They're now in, among the leaders of doing things that have good ecological and good environmental purpose. But uh, we can't get over these problems and until we've got some, some solutions that work, including for the gentleman on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. So that is a capsule story of what the major global issues are for water management. It's a shortage of water. It's changing the character of the water that we have. And uh, coping with what is becoming a water shortage throughout the world because we're pulling the water out of the underground where uh, the, uh, the groundwater used to be our major source of, uh, of water. Uh, so welcome to a world which needs you more and more. And I'm so glad to see the number of things that women are doing. When I first started traveling around the world with various water companies and organizations, I very rarely met women engineers, except in uh, the sanitation, in the uh, uh, sewage and sanitation field, uh, but hardly ever any in the uh, accountancy, the legal, uh, the uh, doing the important work of making sure that the uh, the upkeep and the maintenance was done. I hardly ever met uh, women uh, managers or women 
infrastructure experts in this area. And now this has changed completely. And you've got women construction bosses in water projects and all sorts of really encouraging things. Uh, we are going to have to make some changes in the way that we do things. Desalination will probably be used more and more. I hope that we not only reduce the amount of energy it takes to create desalinated water, but also the looking after the brine. At the moment, we're not doing that very well. We just put the brine back in the ocean. And so in an enclosed water space like the Red Sea, the, the salinity level just goes up and up and the coral and the fish and all the rest of it suffer the same. So therefore, we, we need real attention on desalination. We need new urban designs uh, that will allow us to use water in the urban area and then to take that water away and clean it for reuse. We already do that around the Great Lakes because we have to put 80% of the water back that we take out and it has to be cleaned when it goes back. So uh, this, this, none of this is, not all of this is new, but it's all getting more important and more urgent. Um, we need to build for water neutral buildings, almost. Um, they're not perfect, but it's certainly better than a great, great wasteful buildings. Uh, we need bioengineering uh, for crops. That's a good one because it usually stops people dead and they say, do you mean uh, uh, bioengineered food? And I say, yes. In the last months, we have been so happy about the bioengineering that has gone into medicines, uh, but we are still very leery about bioengineering associated with foods. Uh, maybe CRISPR will do something about that, but uh, the if we're not going to use massive irrigation systems around the world, we've got to reduce the amount of water that's going to crops. And one of the ways of doing that is to reduce the demand of different crops for water. Wastewater reuse, one of my favorite topics. I think I gather that in Canada, we're not doing much of that, although we're uh, in, I was pleased to learn that uh, on the North Shore that uh, we're going to be producing biogas that will at least produce the energy to run the new plant when it is built. We're doing that across the country. I hope we move into real reuse of the nutrients that are in wastewater, not just for energy, but using the nutrients as nutrients. This is being done in not enough countries, but there's about 90 countries that are now reusing uh, wastewater after treatment. So that's definitely something that the world has to do. Canada with its water supplies is probably going to be further down the line in actually doing this. And we need an irrigation revolution. But I'd like to say one more thing to you as women. We have learned so much. The 20th century was a wonderful century for learning, but we learned in silos and people became very expert in their own particular field. And academically, they were encouraged to write papers that only other people in the field uh, were writing about or were reading about. Uh, it's time to figure out how to get out of those silos because we can't just uh, be pursuing one or two goals. We have to be pursuing the social goals uh, and the goals that we need. And women are good at being aware of these and thinking about how these might be done. So I'm not one that has ever agreed that women and men have totally different skills. But in my watching, I think that women can understand when something is siloed and when it needs to start a conversation with another silo very related to the issue. So please go out and knock down a few silos. Thank you for inviting me. And good luck and congratulations to the winners today, but congratulations to all the nominees. Uh, clearly, you're an amazing group, and I'm glad to be talking to an amazing group. Thank you very much.